Welcome to Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. Today we will start our studies through the book of Philippians. If you missed anything uh, from our previous teachings, you can go to our website. It's, it's kuim.org. Or you can go to our SoundCloud or YouTube channel. It is Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. Before we continue, let's have a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity for the brethren to gather today to glean to your word. I thank you, Father God, because your word is always alive. I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you will give us revelation, knowledge, and understanding of your word today. That you will open your word up to our hearts today. Father, I pray that you will help us to understand that to live is Christ and to die is gain or an upgrade. Father, I pray that you will help us by your spirit to live our lives in a way that it will magnify Christ. None of me, but all of you, will give praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I welcome everybody. Today, we will start our studies through the book of Philippians. Uh, before we continue, let me give you a background about, about um, uh, the book of Philippians. The letter was written by Paul, the apostle, and he wrote this letter from prison in Rome. It was written about um, 62 AD. Now, the city Philippi is a Roman colony founded by Philip II of Macedon, who is the father of Alexander the Great, or you can say Alexander the Third of Macedon. How did Paul start this church at Philippi? Uh, if you read through the Acts of the Apostles, he gives us the details. Bring Paul's second missionary journey. He was going to go, or they were going to go to Asia, but the Holy Spirit did not permit them. So he turned to go to Britannia, but the Holy Spirit did not permit them. Now they went to Troas. While Paul was at Troas, he had a vision, and he saw a man in that vision saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. So he understood that God was calling them to go to Macedonia. And the first city they went in there was Philippi. And Philippi, on a Sabbath day, uh, there was no synagogue there. Uh, according to Jewish law, you must have uh, 10 men to start a synagogue. So they were gathering at the river banks. So on the day of, uh, on a Sabbath day, Paul went over there and uh, where he saw some ladies, he met some ladies. One of them was uh, Lydia. Lydia, a merchant of um, of uh, a, a fiber. So uh, uh, Lydia was one of the ones that received the gospel, and Paul got into trouble here with um, with um, uh, Silas, and they were put into jail. They put in. They were put in jail. While they were in jail, uh, something happened. Uh, they were praising God, and that place shook. And all their stocks fell off. And the jailer was going to kill himself. And, but Paul told him not to do so because they were all still there. And as a result of this, the jailer himself came to Christ with his household. So the church at Philippi actually was started by Lydia and uh, the jailer. And it grew. So now... This epistle, some people call it a pistol of joy. Why? 
Because in this letter, Paul used the word joy or rejoice or rejoicing more than 16 times. While Paul was in, in prison at Rome, the church at Philippi took up an offering for him and they sent this offering through Epaphroditus, who delivered it to Paul. When Paul received this offering, uh, not only that Epaphroditus gave him the offering, but he gave him a progress note about the church which he started. Because of this joy, Paul wrote them this letter. This is the summary so far. So we're going to go ahead and dive into today's teaching. And I'll read to you now Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Timothy, born servants of Jesus Christ. Let's stop right there. So Paul wrote this letter and um, he calls himself and Timothy bond servants. That word bond servants there is the Greek word doulos. Doulos means someone who is a servant by choice, not by force, but who chose to be a servant who has given up his own privileges and rights and now has someone that he calls Lord and uh, wants to obey whatever the Lord says. This is the way Paul sees himself as well as Timothy, bond servants of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in our Christian life, as soon as you get born again, you're supposed to see yourself as born servant of Jesus Christ. Someone who has someone they have submitted to, and that person is Jesus Christ, and the submission is by choice, not by compulsion. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. So this is his greeting. He's greeting all the saints. You see the word here, saints. Uh, if you ask someone who is not a Christian what a saint mean, they will say someone who is perfect. You know, you can hear them in their conversation. They will say, I'm not a saint. And some denomination will say a saint is someone who is canonized. Someone who lived a very good life and uh, miracles are done in his name or her name. So now they will pray to this person. But what does the word of God say about saint? That word is a hagios. That's the Greek word for it. It means holy, consecrated to. So anyone who is born again is consecrated to God. Is separated unto God. In Paul's epistles, the epistle he wrote to uh, to the Romans, to Corinthians, uh, to Colossians, he used that word "saint," talking to people who are alive, people who are living. So the word "saint" is not someone who is dead. But it's someone who is alive and is consecrated unto God. Now he's talking about this letter addressed to bishops, which means overseers, pastors. Uh, that word is interchangeable in the New Testament. And he also addressed this letter to deacons. Now a deacon in the time when Paul wrote this letter, is someone who is not in the leadership position. It is someone who is a helper in the church. Uh, that's what it means. So we proceed in verse 2. It says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He continues his greeting here. He says, Grace and peace. If you follow Paul's epistles very close, that's how he, ha he, he will greet. 
grace and peace, always in this order. And the reason why it's in this order is until you discover the grace of God, you will not have the peace of God in your life. Until you acknowledge that you are saved by grace. It's not because of your good works. It is a free gift that God receives you because of what Jesus Christ did, not because of your own performance. The moment you know, you, you, you acknowledge that your peace with God will just be established. You will no longer be in fear. Now you know that you are accepted in the beloved. So he will always greet people, grace and peace. Now we move into verse 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with you all with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. So now, Paul begins to thank God for the Philippians, the church at uh, Philippi. Like I said, Epaphroditus brought him an offering from Philippi. And he gave him a progress note of uh, how the church has grown and all the good things happening in the church. Paul was so excited, so happy to hear about this progress. Remember, John said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in love, walk in faith, walk in truth. So, Paul was so excited to know that uh, God using him as a vessel, because it is something so joyful to know that um, the place where God is using you as a vessel is making progress. So he was so happy and he was so thankful to God that this church is making progress. But he also acknowledged that this progress that the church is making is not because of Paul himself. He noticed that um, the rest is not to the swift. Neither is the battle to the strong. He noticed that it is not by might nor by power, but it is by the Spirit of God. That this progress that the church is making is because of the power of the Holy Ghost. So he says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So he sees that this progress is made because of the power of the Holy Ghost. And he has this confidence that the Spirit of God will continue to do the work. Remember Paul says, I planted Apollo's waters, but God gave the increase. As long as we continue to yield ourselves, to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the church will make progress. And God will perfect those things which pertains to us. As long as we continue to look up to Jesus Christ as the author and the finisher of our faith. So Paul was so excited here, giving thanks to God for the progress that is going on in the church. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baruch Hashem Adonai. We are now in verse 9. And this I pray that you, your love may abound till more, still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment. I take that again. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all the summit. Paul begins to pray for them now about uh, love. Pray for them to grow in love. The love of Christ towards one another. The Bible says that the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit which is given unto us in Romans chapter 5 verse 5. So because of the power of the Holy Ghost in us, we have the unlimited ability to love. So Paul prays for them to love here. But he does not stop there. He prays that their love will be governed by two conditions. The first condition he wants to govern their love is knowledge. And the second condition that he wants to govern their love is discernment. And in verse 10, he tells us the reason why. He wants their love to be governed by knowledge and by discernment. Verse 10, he says, that you may approve the things that are excellent. That you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Excellent. So he tells you the reason here why he wants their love to be governed by knowledge. Now the knowledge he's talking about here is the knowledge of the word of God. The entrance of his word will give light and understanding to the simple, the Bible says. He says, your word is a, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pot. He wants them to have a good knowledge and understanding of the scriptures, the word of God. While they practice their love, while they grow in their love. For the simple reason what love means in the word of God is different from what love means outside the word of God. People in the word, when they are committing fornication and adultery, they say, uh, we are making love. Can you hear that? That's the term they use. But he wants them to have understanding of the word of God that that is not love in the word of God. That the Bible tells us that our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost who lives in us. That if we love somebody, we're not going to lure them into committing fornication or adultery with them. Now, there are so many things the world will do. They will say, I don't want to tell him the truth because I don't want to break his heart. You see that? But the Bible tells us that we have to tell the truth in love. We have to speak the truth in love. So if you don't have a good understanding of the word of God, you will be confused with what love means. Because what love means in the word of God is different from what it means in outside the word of God. So this is why Paul prays this prayer for them. Bible says that um, uh, let love be without uh, hypocrisy. He says, uh, abhor that which is evil and cling to that which is good. So he wants them to have this discernment, this understanding of uh, what love means. So that we will be able to express our love in the way that is good and acceptable in the sight of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 12. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. 
so that it has become evident to the whole palace God and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. So he tells them now, they already knew that he was in jail. So Paul tells them that uh, he doesn't want them to be discouraged because the things that happened to him, these things have led to the furtherance of the gospel. Now, what are the things that happened to Paul? Remember in Jerusalem, he was falsely accused and arrested. In uh, Caesarea, he spent two years there in the prison. Under Fidelis, Festus, Agrippa, he had three mistrials. To the extent he said, I plead to Caesar. And he was transported to Rome. But on the way to Rome, he had a shipwreck. These are the things that happened to Paul. But he is saying that good things came out of this thing that happened to him. They weren't just uh, a normal occurrences. And what are the good things that came out of this? Let me tell you, there's so many of them. On his way, when they had the shipwreck, on his way to Rome, remember they stopped at the island called Malta. And Malta, the people there, both their king and the people there received the gospel. What a good stopover to make. <laughs> he didn't even plan it. <laughs> but people received gospel. Now he talked about the palace guard. Paul was chained at Rome uh, 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 with um, emperor, with the, 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 the emperor guide. The palace guard. And these guards, they will, they will take oh, like six hour shifts. So every six hours, they will change their, uh, uh, they, they will rotate. And you know Paul. So every six hours, somebody is receiving the gospel. In Acts of the Apostles, he tells us that uh, even Caesar's household also received the gospel. Paul received visitors. Uh, 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 and you remember, you see what happened to those visitors. Roman citizens who visited Paul received the gospel. Jews who were there who visited Paul received the gospel. So he says, the gospel, this, the thing that happened to him did not hinder the gospel. Rather, it paved way for many more to come into the kingdom of God. Remember that all things work together for good. In your trials and your tribulations, when you go through diverse temptations, as long as you have it at the back of your mind, God is in control, that he is walking behind the scene. Not only that he's walking behind the scene, but he's moving everything that is behind the scene. Then you will understand that, uh, he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. Then good things will come out of it. He says, count it all joy when you go through driver's trials. When you go through different trials. In all things, the Bible says, give thanks. We are not thanking God because of the bad situation that happened. But we are thanking God because we know he is above all things. That he is able to deliver. Behold, I am the God, the Lord of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Nothing is hard for God. So in our Christian works, this is teaching us to have that consciousness that in every opposition, in everything that comes across our way, the all things will always work to our own advantage. There are things that happen in your life. At the moment when they were happening, you thought you were hemmed in. You thought that was the end of you. You thought nothing good will come out of it. But all of a sudden, out of the blues, deliverance came. You were rescued. Things turned out for your own good. And there are some that it took some years for you to see that the thing that happened there was not for your own disadvantage. It was for your own good. 
So it gives us that impression, that understanding as children of God to always look at things in the in the in the way of God, knowing that uh, He that has begun this good work in you will perfect it, continue to perfect it until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 14, he says, And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my change, are more, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here he talks about our attitude. What our attitude as Christians should be. He's saying here that uh, so many people, instead of being discouraged because of his bond, because of his imprisonment, rather they went out there and they spoke the word of God with boldness. It did not hinder them. Now, in our Christian work, in our Christian life, in preaching the gospel, in contending honestly for the faith that is delivered to us, we must have this consciousness, this boldness. Remember Jesus Christ said that uh, a servant is not greater than his master. He says, if they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. But if they heed to me, now they will listen to you. The Bible tells us that uh, those that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Jesus says in the word you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the word. When we became Christians, the thing that came with it is persecution. It is normal. It will happen. Jesus Christ told us that it will happen. Remember Paul, when he was converted, going from Jerusalem, he was heading to Damascus. On his way, he got arrested by Jesus. And when God, when Jesus Christ sent Ananias to go lay hands on him so that he can recover his sight, he told him, he said, I have showed him how much he will suffer for my name's sake. Paul was away. He didn't run away. He didn't say, oh no, I'm not going to do this. Rather, I remember what Paul said, necessity is laid upon me. Woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. He didn't give up. He didn't back out. He didn't chicken out. Jeremiah, you remember the story of Jeremiah when God called him. He said, I want you, I'm going to send you to the people and I'm going to give you the messages for them. But he turns around and he tells them, do not be afraid of their faces <laughs> because I will deliver you. God knows that opposition will come. But he promised Jeremiah, I'm going to deliver you. Jeremiah was sent to kings. He was sent to princes. He was sent to prophets. He was sent to priests. And he prophesied unto them. At some point, they took hold of him and they put him in stocks and they threw him in dungeon. But he did not stop. He did not stop. God delivered him, even the point when they wanted to kill him. We should know that we will never be ashamed of the gospel. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So, when we, because Jesus Christ called every one of us to go into the nation and preach the gospel, whether you are called into the ministry or not, he asked every one of us to go into the nations and uh, preach the gospel to all creatures. So we should have this consciousness that I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. 
And the life I live now in the flesh, I live by the faith of all. Lord Jesus Christ, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the attitude we got to cultivate as Christians. Never to give up. Never to give up because of persecution. How long is persecution going to happen? How long? How long is it going to happen? It wouldn't take, it wouldn't, it would not take forever. By the time you know it, you go be with Jesus. Either by rapture or by death. So what are you going to lose? We continue. Remember the Bible says that uh, those that win souls, they are wise. And they will shine. Those that turn many to righteousness will shine like the stars. Do not be hindered because of persecution. Remember that God will always deliver you. In verse 18, I'm sorry, verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife. And some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition. Not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my chains. But the latter out of love knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way whether in pretense or in truth Christ is preached. And in this, I rejoice. Yes, and will rejoice. What is he talking about here? He's talking about rivalry, competition, contention in the church. There were those who preached the gospel just to prove a point. Just to glorify themselves. Because Paul was in bondage. He was in bond. And the same thing is happening today. Even in the house of God. There are people who have. Arterial motives. In the church. Some people will pull other groups. From the church. Other members from the church. And they will go across the streets. And they will start another church just to prove a point to the pastor because they disagreed with him. So they want him. They want to prove a point to him. Remember what Jesus Christ said. He said, in that day, many will come to me and they will say, we have prophesied in your name. Cast out demons in your name. Work the miracles in your name. But Jesus Christ said, And I will say to them, I know you not. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Why did he say so? Because their motives were wrong. They did it for their own glory. It wasn't out of the love of God. Paul says, As a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation. Someone builds upon the foundation. But he says, Take heed how you build on this foundation. For there is no other foundation that is laid apart from Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he says, Whether you build with uh, gold or silver, precious stones, or wood, or hair, or straw. He says, the works will be tried with fire. And those that will survive the fire will receive a word. But those that don't survive the fire will be, will take losses. Even though they will be saved. So, it talks about the motives. The reason why we do what we do. And it tells us that the works that we do will be tested. 
And some of them will be destroyed because we did not do them out of the love of God. We did them because our own pride, our own selfish interest. So this is what Paul is talking about here. Examine yourself. What is the reason why you do what you do for God in the church? What is the reason why you do what you do? Are you doing it to be seen? Jesus Christ says, he says, when you do your righteous deed, he says, take heed. Do not do your righteous deed before men to be seen by men. He says, because I tell you right now, you've already gotten your reward. But if you are that one that they opposed, the one that they persecuted, he tells you here, he says, don't go into strife and contention with them. Leave them alone. I think it was Confucius who said, he that throws mud loses the ground. So he don't want to lose the ground with them. As long as what they're doing leads to the advancement of the kingdom of God. People are being saved from what they're doing. Rejoice and give glory to God. Even though they're going to lose their rewards because of their motives were wrong. But rejoice with them. Don't get into contention with them. That's what he's saying here. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and remember, do not be, don't worry. Don't worry because the only one that sees their heart is, is God. He says, I, the Lord, searches the heart. I try the reins in Jeremiah 17. So he sees the heart of everyone. And he knows the reason why they do what they do. We are now in verse 19. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. He's telling them here, he, he understood they were praying for him, the importance of prayers. So he tells them that he's going to turn this condition, him being in prison, he's going to turn out for good because God is going to deliver him. Now he's not talking about God is going to deliver him from the prison. That's not what he's talking about. Because in the next verse, he talked about if he dies or he lives. So that's not what he's talking about. Now, remember that the deliverance, God's deliverance is different from our own deliverance. His own deliverance may not agree with our own expected deliverance. Paul understands here that even if he dies, it's still a deliverance. <laughs> Are you hearing me, my friends? And if he's set free, it's still a deliverance. And as a matter of fact, both of these happened to Paul. When he appeared before Caesar Nero, he, Caesar Nero set him free. He went free. But after one year, he was rearrested. And now they put him uh, at Mamantin prison in Rome, an underground Rome, uh, an underground prison. And he went to, for trial the second time. And uh, you know what happened? Caesar Nero, at his edict, Paul's head was cut off from his shoulder. So now, both of them happened. So when we are praying, remember, prayer, the purpose of prayer is for the will of God to be done. Not your own will. The will of God. Whenever you are praying, the purpose, that's why we got to go to the word of God and find out what does the word say about what you are about to pray? It cannot be something that is in accordance to the will of God. So when we are asking for God's deliverance and his deliverance comes, it may not be exactly what we are expecting. But remember, he says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. What do you want? Your own ways? I wouldn't want my own ways. I would always want the ways of God for my life. Because the steps of the righteous are guided by God, by his word. 
we continue in um, in verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness, as always, now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether life or by death. So now he talks about Christ being magnified in his own body. Whether he lives or or he dies. That's why I told you that he wasn't praying for God to deliver him from prison. Because he talks about two options here. Whether he lives or he dies. But what he's saying here is his own life will always be for the glory of God. To magnify Jesus. How do you magnify Jesus? Someone will say. The creator of the heaven and the earth. How are you going to magnify him? Now, by the way we live our lives as Christians, we can magnify Christ to other people, in the sight of other people. If there are people around you who are not Christians, who don't even acknowledge Christ, Who don't even recognize him as God. Through the way we live. Our mannerisms. Through the way we we, we live a, a life that is reflective of sound doctrine. We can magnify Christ in their lives. The one that doesn't believe. They will see the way things are going for you. And they will see how you live your own life. It will bring them to that point where they will ask you and say something different about you. What is that? And you can see that you bringing them into the kingdom of God before Christ was nothing to them, but now is magnified in their lives. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the way Christians are to live around other people. So that through our own lives, we can help other people magnify Christ in their own lives. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 21. For to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh. This will mean food for my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two. Having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful to you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith. That your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is saying here, he says, if I live, my life is going to be for Christ. But if I die, he says, it's an upgrade. (laughs) He says, it's an upgrade. Why is it an upgrade? Because he's going to be right in his presence. (laughs) To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But he says that is something more important than departing right away and being present with God. And that thing that is very important is the fulfillment of the God's plan and purpose for your life while you are here on earth. That is the reason why everybody is here. Our only reason of being here is not for us just to raise up children, uh, buy a house and uh, uh, get a job and uh, grow old and die. No, that's not it at all. You got to find out what is the purpose of your being here. To Paul, the purpose of being here is to bring people into the kingdom of God. Is to teach them the word of God. Is to advance the word of God. Is to live for Christ. 
So find out what you are here for. The Holy Spirit of God will help you find that out. If you ask him, he will tell you. Because we are here to fight a good fight of faith. Laying hold of eternal life while we are here. There got to be a purpose why Jesus Christ said, Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. Are you going to reward somebody who did nothing? Who just folded their hands? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of hands to sleep. Then shall your poverty come as a traveler. Is he the one Jesus is going to reward? He says you've been faithful over a little. Now I make you ruler over much. Enter now into the joy of your father. What are you faithful over? Find out what that is. In this world, we got to be an oasis of love to the troubled world. An oasis of our righteousness to the troubled world. There gotta be something that you are here to do for the kingdom of God. For we are his own workmanship, created unto good works. There is a purpose so that we have to fulfill those things which God has called us to do from the foundation of the world. So Paul, he noticed, he knows. There is no time for him to check out because he hasn't done his own work. But when the time came, when the fullness of time came, he said, I fought a good fight. I finished my curse. I kept the faith. Now he's ready to check out because he accomplished the plan and the purpose of our Lord Jesus Christ for his life. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we continue to verse 27. We're almost done, so I'm sure we're going to finish on time. Verse 27, it says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your faith, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. So he exhausts them again, encourages them again to live lives that will reflect sound doctrine. Lives that will reflect their confession. By confession, I mean when you profess or you confess that I'm a Christian, that got to be a corresponding life. When you are born again and the Spirit of God moves in you, there got to be fruits of that righteousness that it will be expressed outwardly that someone can see and recognize that you are a child of God, you are a Christian. So he tells them to live and conduct their life worthy of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are saved by faith in what Jesus Christ did. That's how we, we, we are saved. Not by works. But after we are saved, God expects us to bear fruit. He expects us to live lives, to live a godly life. A life that will be worthy of emulation. A life that will speak good things of God. A life that will represent Christ to the fullest. That is that expectation. God wants us to do that. So he tells them to do this. And then at the end, he tells them to be one in Christ. Don't let uh, non-essential things divide you. You may disagree over non-essential things, but don't let that divide you. This is Satan's modus operandi. He comes inside the church and he plants seeds of division because he knows that he's persecuting the church from the outside doesn't work. Rather, he makes the church grow. So he devises a means of coming inside 
And he uses members, members of churches to divide the church. Paul warns them to stay away from division. And know that uh, when we stand together, we can achieve a lot for the kingdom of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 28. And not in any way terrified by your adversaries. Which is to them a proof of prediction. But to you of salvation and that from God. Do not let unbelievers threaten you. Through the way they live. Through their get quick rich uh, schemes. Some of them will even threaten you and they will threaten to place a curse on you. Do not be moved. The Bible says, as the bird by wallowing. And as they wallow by flying. He says, the cause, cause shall not come. As they bear by wandering. As they wallow by flying, he says, the cause, costless shall not come. It will not come to you. So do not be intimidated by their own lifestyles. Don't let them intimidate you because of the way they live. Their fake lives. The psalmist says that he was troubled because of the prosperity of the ungodly. Until he went into the house of God, he found out how they were going to end up. When they see that you are not moved by all their devices and their ways, to them it will be a signal that they are headed for destruction. That's what he's saying here. And perhaps this will bring them to order, into rep to repentance. But to you, you know this is salvation. Not because of your own ability or because of your own strength. But the salvation is from God. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. For it is God who is at work in us, both to will and to do of his own pleasure. Therefore, I can do all things through Christ Jesus Christ, which strengthens me. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not be moved. Stand bold. For the salvation of God will always be for you. In um, So, in verse 29, the same, I think we are still in verse 29. We are in verse 29 now. So it says, for to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ. Not only to believe in him. But also to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict which you saw in me. And now here is in me. He wants us to know that it is an opportunity. A privilege. For us to be born again, not only to be born again, but to suffer with Christ. It is an opportunity. It's a privilege. He doesn't want us to see it as something that should trouble us. Jesus Christ himself tells us ahead of time, those who are born again, in the world you will have tribulations, but be of good courage, for I have overcome the world. To suffer with Christ is expected. Jude says, contend earnestly for that faith, which once and for all was delivered to all the saints. Contend earnestly for that faith. For that faith. Remember that our trials and our tribulations has a purpose. God allows them 
Sometimes they are there to work patience, to give us perseverance. In your trials and your tribulations, when you are suffering for Christ through persecutions, remember always that he, his word says, Behold, I am with you even to the end of time. That I will never leave you nor forsake you. Paul says that I, the, 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 the sufferings of this world, I reckon, that the sufferings of this world can never be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. For the, our light affliction, which is only but for a, a moment, it's only for a moment. Have that at the back of your mind. He says, why we look not at the things seen, but the things that are not seen. For those things that are seen are temporary. Things which are not seen, they are eternal. So it is a temporary thing. It's going to go away before you know it. So count it all joy. Know that it's a privilege to suffer with Christ. To be a representative of Christ. Let it be something you gotta brag about. Let him that brag, brag that he knows me and he understands me. Remember, there's gonna be a day when all of these things will be over. Is this gonna, it's not gonna be forever. You can never live here forever. Have this consciousness that the coming and the return of Jesus Christ is imminent. Then he will show up any time. Every day live your life as that one who is waiting for the master. For he that works do not entangle himself with the face of this word. So that he will please that one who had chosen him to be a soldier. Always look up to Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Good friends of mine, I have come to the end of today's program, today's teaching. If you under the sound of my voice and you are not yet a Christian, you are not born again, Jesus Christ is not your Lord and your Savior, now is an opportunity you can make that right, right now. Now, to be born again means that uh, you put aside your own good works. You depend on Jesus Christ for salvation only. You believe that he, he, he died for your sins. He's the son of God. That God raised him from the dead. That he washed away all your sins. Then you ask him to come into your life and be your Lord and your Savior. And then you begin a master-servant relationship with him. There is no other way you can do it. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Except the name of Jesus Christ. For except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But unfortunately, so many religions, they think that uh, we have one God and we can approach God through so many ways. But it's not so, friends. The Bible tells us that uh, unless you have Jesus Christ, you cannot have God. You don't have access to the Father. The only access you can have to the Father is through Jesus Christ of Nazareth. But you got to be the one who will make the choice. He created us as free mortal agents. The choice is for us to make. And unless you make that choice, no one will make it for you. The choice to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior is yours to make. The time is very short. And he says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If you hear my, if you hear my voice and you open the door, I will come in, I will eat with you and you will eat with me. 
the time is very short. About 155,000 people died today in this world. Where did they go? Because man is a spirit and the spirit cannot die. All they did was they checked out of their body. Out of their body. So where did they go? It depends on the choice they made when they were still alive. If they chose Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they would go to heaven and be with God. But if they did not make that decision, the only choice they have is hell. Hell is a place of torture. It is a place of uh, darkness where there is no God. You don't want to make the choice of going to hell. But now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. The choice you made today is what's going to determine your eternity. What are you waiting for? Jesus says, if you don't believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. He that has the son has life. But he that has not the son has no life and the wrath of God abides in him. David talking to Jonathan says, there is only but one step between me and death. Make one step between you and hell today. Make that step Jesus Christ. Receive him as your Lord and your Savior. And you will begin a brand new life with him. My friends, I am going to lead you now in a very short prayer. If you pray this prayer and you mean it with all your heart, you will right now be born again. Your spirit will be recreated. Pray this prayer with me. Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I know that he is my Lord and my Savior. He died for my sins. You raised him up from the dead on the third day. Jesus Christ, I ask you this day to come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. I believe now by faith that I'm born again. That I'm a child of God. My sins are washed away. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Father God, I give you all the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Congratulations. Welcome into the kingdom of God if you pray that prayer. Find a very good church where they teach the word of God. Become a member of that church. Because now you are a baby Christian. So you need to grow in your faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Peter says, desire the sincere milk of the word of God that you may grow thereby. Now there is another, there is a subsequent experience after salvation. We call it the infilling of the Holy Spirit of God. Evident by speaking with other tongues. If you would like to know more about this, if you go to my YouTube channel, Simple Truth Gospel with Kyrian, you will find a teaching there titled, Speaking in Tongues is for All Believers. It will help you, enlighten you, and teach you what you need to know about this subsequent experience. I want to use this opportunity to thank our partners all over the world, those that are helping us to spread the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ through their prayers for us and their financial assistance. If you would like to become a partner, please go to our website. It is kuim.org and there is a donation button there where you can securely give your gifts to help us even further the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, it is only those who hear the gospel, the word of God, and they do it. Those are the ones who get the full benefits of the word of God. I pray for you this day. The Lord bless you and be with you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and give you prosperity and give you divine health in the name of Jesus. And surely there is an end and your expectations will never be cut off. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Baruch Hashem Adonai Kangaboske Tiaragoste. Eh grendo mania na suriara para coche kangala da prage de burma england skip